Hi everybody and welcome to Lesson 7. We're going to start by having a look at a kind of regularization called weight decay. And the issue that we came to uh, at the end of the last lesson is that we were training our simple dot product model with bias, and uh, our loss started going down, and then it started going up again. Um, and so we have a problem that we are overfitting. And remember, in this case, we're using mean squared error. So try to recall why it is that we don't need a metric here. Um, because mean squared error is pretty much the thing we care, to care about, really. Or we could use um, mean absolute error if we like. But either of those works fine as a loss function. They don't have the problem of big flat areas like accuracy does for classification. So what we want to do is to make it less likely that we're going to um, overfit by doing something we call reducing the capacity of the model. The capacity of the model is basically how much space does it have to find answers. And if it can kind of find any answer anywhere, uh, those answers can include um, basically memorizing the data set. So one way to handle this would be to decrease the number of latent factors. Um, but generally speaking, Reducing the number of parameters in a model, um, particularly as we look at more deep learning style models, um, ends up biasing the models towards very simple kind of shapes. Um, so there's a better way to do it. Rather than reducing the number of parameters, instead we try to force the parameters to be um, smaller unless they're really required to be big. And the way we do that is with weight decay. Weight decay is also known as L2 regularization. They're very slightly different, but we can think of them as the same thing. And what we do is we change our loss function. And specifically, we change the loss function by adding to it the sum of all the weights squared. Uh, in fact, all of the parameters squared, really should say. Um, why do we do that? Well, because if that's part of the loss function, then one way to decrease the loss would be to decrease the weights one particular weight, or all of the weights, or, or something like that. Um, and so when we decrease the weights, um, if you think about what that would do, then think about, for example, um, the different possible um, uh, values of a in y equals ax squared. Uh, the larger a is, for example, a is 50, you get these very narrow peaks. Um, in general, big coefficients are going to cause big swings, big changes in the, in the loss, the small changes in the parameters. And when you have these kind of sharp peaks or valleys, it means that a small change to the parameter uh, can make a, sorry, a small change to the input can make a big change to the loss. And so if, you ha if you're in that situation, then you can basically fit all the data points close to exactly with a really complex, jagged function with sharp changes, which exactly tries to sit uh, on each data point, rather than finding a nice smooth surface which connects them all together, uh, or goes through them all. So if we limit our weights um, by adding in to the loss function the sum of the weights squared, um, then what it's going to do is it's going to fit less well on the training set, because we're giving it less room to try anything that it wants to, but we're going to hope that it would result in a better uh, loss on the validation set or the test set, so that it will generalize better. One way to think about this is that the loss with weight decay is just the loss plus the sum of the parameters squared times some number we pick, a hyperparameter. Sometimes it's like 0.1 or 0.01 or 0.001 kind of region. Um, so this is basically what loss with weight decay looks like in this equation. But remember, when it actually comes to what's, how is the loss used in stochastic gradient descent, it's used by taking its gradient. So what's the gradient of this? Well, if you remember back to um, when you first learned calculus, uh, it's okay if you don't, uh, the gradient of something squared is just two times that something, 
Uh, we've changed from parameters to weight, which is a bit confusing. So just use weight here to keep it consistent. Maybe parameters is better. Um, so the derivative of weight squared is just 2 times weight. So in other words, to add in this term uh, to the gradient, we can just add to the gradients weight decay times 2 times weight. And since weight decay is just a hyperparameter, we can just replace it with weight decay times 2, so that would just give us weight decay times weight. So weight decay refers to um, adding on the to the gradients, uh, the weights times some hyperparameter. And so that is going to try to create these kind of more shallow, uh, less bumpy surfaces. So to do that, um, we can simply, when we call fit or fit one cycle or whatever, we can pass in a WD parameter, and that's just this number here. So if we pass in point 0.1, then the training loss goes from 0.29 to 0.49, so it's much worse, right, because we can't overfit anymore, but the valid loss goes from 0.89 to 0.82, much better. So this is an important thing to remember for those of you that have done a lot of more traditional statistical models, um, is in kind of more traditional statistical models we try to avoid overfitting and we try to increase generalization, by decreasing the number of parameters. Um, but in a lot of modern machine learning, and certainly deep learning, um, we tend to instead use um, regularization, uh, such as weight decay, because um, it gives us more flexibility, it lets us use more nonlinear functions, uh, and still, avoid, you know, still reduces the capacity of the model. Great, so we're down to 0.823. This is a good model. Um, this is really actually a, 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 a very good uh, model. Um, and so let's dig into actually what's going on here, because in our, in our architecture, um, remember, uh, we basically just had four embedding layers. So what's an embedding layer? We've described it conceptually, but let's write our own. And remember we said that an embedding layer is just a computational shortcut for doing a matrix multiplication by a one hot encoded matrix and that that is actually the same as just indexing into an array. So an embedding is just a um, indexing into an array. Um, and so it's nice to be able to create our own versions of things that exist in PyTorch and FastAI, so let's do that for embedding. Um, so if we're going to create our own kind of layer, which is pretty cool, um, we need to be aware of something, which is normally a a layer is basically created by inheriting, as we've discussed, from module or nn.module. Uh, so for example, this is an example here of a module where we've created a class called t that inherits from module, and when it's constructed, remember that's what dunder init does, we're just going to set, this is just a, a dummy little module here, we're going to set self.a to the number one repeated three times as a tensor. Now if you remember back to notebook four, we talked about how the optimizers in PyTorch and FastAI rely on being able to grab the parameters attribute to find a list of all the parameters. Now if you want to be able to optimize self.a, you would need to, it to appear in parameters, but actually there's nothing there. Why is that? That's because PyTorch does not assume that everything that's in a module is something that needs to be learnt. To tell it that it's something that needs to be learnt, you have to wrap it with nn.parameter. So here's exactly the same class, but torch.ones, which is just a list of three, three ones in this case, is wrapped in nn.parameter, and now if I go parameters, I see I have a parameter with three ones in it. And that's going to automatically call requires grad underscore for us as well. Um, we haven't had to do that for things like nn.linear, in the past, because PyTorch automatically uses nn.parameter internally, so if we have a look at the parameters for something that uses nn.linear uh, with no bias layer, you'll see again we have here a parameter with three things in it. So we want to, in general, be able to create a parameter, so something with a, a tensor with a bunch of things in, and generally we want to randomly initialize them. 
So to randomly initialize, we can pass in the size we want, we can initialize a tensor of zeros of that size, and then randomly generate some normal, normally distributed random numbers with a mean of zero, standard deviation of 0.01, no particular reason I'm picking those numbers, just to show how this works. So here's something that will give us back a um, set of parameters of any size we want. And so now we're going to replace everywhere that used to say embedding, I'm going to replace it with create params. Uh, everything else here is the same in the init, under init. And then the forward is very, very similar to before. As you can see, I'm grabbing the zero index column from X, that's my users, and I just look it up, as you see, in that user factors array. And the cool thing is I don't have to do anything with gradients myself for this uh, manual embedding layer because PyTorch can figure out the gradients automatically, as we've discussed. So then I just got the dot product as before, add on the bias as before, do the sigmoid range as before. And so here's a dot product bias without any special PyTorch layers, uh, and we fit, and we get the same result. So I think that is pretty amazingly cool. We've really shown that the embedding layer is nothing fancy, it's nothing magic, right? It's just indexing into an array. So hopefully that um, removes a bit of the mystery for you. So let's have a look at this model that we've created and we've trained, um, and find out what it's learned. So it's already useful, we've got something we can make pretty accurate predictions with. Um, but let's find out what, those, uh, what the model looks like. So remember when we, we create... have a question. Um, okay, let's take a question before you can look at this. What's the advantage of creating our own embedding layer over the stock PyTorch one? Oh, nothing at all. We're just showing that we can. It's, it's great to be able to dig under the surface because at some point you'll want to try doing new things. So a good way to learn to do new things is to be able to replicate things that already exist, um, and you can check that you understand how they work. It's also a great way to understand the foundations of what's going on, um, is to actually create in code your own implementation. Um, but I wouldn't expect you to use this implementation in practice. Um, but basically it removes all the mystery. So if you remember, we've created a learner called learn, and to get to the model that's inside it, you can always call learn.model. And then inside that, there's going to be um, automatically created for, well sorry, not automatically, we've created all these attributes, movie factors, movie bias, bias, and so forth. So we can grab learn.model.moviebias. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort that vector, and I'm going to print out the first five titles. And so what this is going to do is it's going to print out the, the movies with the smallest bias. And here they are. What does this mean? Well, that kind of means these are the uh, five movies that um, people really didn't like. <laughs> um, but it's more than that. It's, it's not only do people not like them, but if we take account of the, uh, the genre they're in, the actors they have, you know, whatever the latent factors are, People liked them a lot less than they expected. So maybe, for example, people, this is kind of, I, I haven't seen any of these movies, luckily, <laughs> but perhaps this is a, um, a sci-fi movie, um, so people who kind of like these sci-fi movies found they're so bad they still didn't like it. Um, so we can do the exact opposite, which is to sort sending, and here are the top five movies and specifically they're the top five by bias, right? So these are the movies that even after you take account of the fact that um, LA Confidential, I have seen all of these ones, so LA Confidential is a kind of a murder mystery cop movie, I guess, and people who don't necessarily like that genre, or I think Guy Pearce was in it, so maybe they don't like Guy Pearce very much, whatever, people still liked this movie more than they expected. Um, so this is a kind of a, a nice thing that we can look inside our model and see what it's learned. And we can look at not only at the um, a bias vector, um, but we can also look at the factors. Now there are 50 factors, which is too many to visualize, uh, so we can use a technique called PCA, Principal Components Analysis. The details don't matter, but basically they're going to squish those 50 factors down to 3, and then we'll plot the top two 
um, as you can see here. And uh, what we see when we plot the top two um, is we can kind of see that the movies have been kind of spread out across a space of, of some kind of latent factors. And so if you look at the far right, there's a whole bunch of kind of big budget action-y things. And on the far left, there's more like cult kind of things, Fargo, Schindler's List, uh, Monty Python. Um, by the same token, at the bottom, we've got some uh, English patient, Harry and Harry Met Sally, so kind of romance drama kind of stuff. And at the top, we've got uh, action and sci-fi kind of stuff. So you can see, even though we haven't passed in any information about these movies, um, all we've seen is who likes what, um, these latent factors have automatically kind of figured out a space or a way of thinking about these movies based on what kinds of movies people like and what other kinds of movies they like along with those. So that's really interesting to kind of try and visualize um, what's going on inside your model. Now we don't have to do all this um, manually. Um, we can actually just say, give me a collab learner using this set of data loaders with this number of factors and this Y range, and it does everything we've just seen. Again, about the same number. Okay, so now you can see, this is nice, right? We've actually been able to see right underneath inside the Collab Learner part of the Fast AI application, the Collaborative Filtering application, and we can build it all ourselves from scratch. We know how to create the SGD, know how to create the embedding layer, we know how to create the, um, the, the model, the architecture. Um, so now you can see, you know, we've really can build up from scratch our own version of this. So if we just type learn.model, you can see here the names are a bit more generic. This is a user weight, item weight, user bias, item bias, but it's basically the same stuff we've seen before. And we can replicate the exact analyses we saw before by using this same idea. Okay. Um, slightly different order this time because it is a bit random, um, but pretty similar as well. Another interesting thing we can do is we can think about the distance between two movies. So let's grab all the movie factors, or just pop them into a variable, um, and then let's pick some movie, and then let's find um, the distance from that movie to every other movie. And so one way of thinking about distance is, you might recall the Pythagorean formula, or uh, the distance on, on, a, uh, on the hypotenuse of a triangle, which is also the distance to a, a point uh, on a, on a, in a Cartesian plane, on a chart, which is root x squared plus y squared. Um, you might know, it doesn't matter if you don't, but you can do exactly the same thing for 50 dimensions. It doesn't just work for two dimensions. Um, there's a, um, so that tells you how far away a, a point is from another point, if, you, if x and y are actually differences between two movie um, vectors. Um, so then what gets interesting is you can actually then um, divide that uh, kind of by the, by the length to make all the lengths the same distance to find out how the angle between any two movies, and that actually turns out to be a really good way to compare the similarity of two things. That's called cosine similarity. And so the details don't matter, you can look them up if you're interested. Um, but the basic idea here is to see that we can actually pick a movie and find the movie that is the most similar to it um, based on these factors. Kind of interesting. I have a question. All right. Uh, what motivated learning at a 50 dimensional embedding and then using PA to reduce? A three versus just learning a three-dimensional. Oh, because the purpose of this was actually to create a good model. Um, so the, the the visualization part is normally kind of the exploration of what's going in on in your model. And so with a fifty uh, with fifty latent factors, you're going to get a more accurate. So that's one approach. Is this um, dot product version? 
Um, there's another version we could use, which is we could um, create a set of user factors and a set of item factors, and just like before, we could look them up. But what we could then do instead of um, doing a dot product, we could concatenate them together into a tensor that contains both the user and the movie factors next to each other, and then we could pass them through a simple little neural network, linear, ReLU, linear, and then sigmoid range as before. So importantly here, the first linear layer, the number of inputs is equal to the um, number of user factors plus the number of item factors, um, and the number of outputs is however many activations uh, we have. Um, and then, uh, which maybe we just default to 100 here, and then the final layer will go from 100 to 1 because we're just making one prediction. And so we could create, um, so we'll call that collab NN, we can instantiate that to create a model, we can create a learner, and we can fit. Um, it's not going quite as well as before, it's not terrible, but it's not quite as good as our dot product version. Um, but the interesting thing here is it does give us some more flexibility which is that since we're not doing a dot product, we can actually have a different uh, embedding size for each of users versus items. And actually FastAI has a simple heuristic, if you call get embedding size and pass in your data loaders, it will suggest appropriate size um, embedding matrices for each of your categorical variables, okay, so each of your uh, user and item um, uh, tensors. Um, so that's uh, so. If, if we pass in star m's embeddings, uh, that's going to pass in the user tuple and the item tuple, which we can then pass to embedding. This is this star uh, prefix we learned about in the last class, in case you forgot. So this is kind of interesting. We can. Um, you know, we can see here that there's two different architectures we could pick from. It wouldn't be necessarily obvious ahead of time which one's going to work better. Um, in this particular case, the the simplest one, the the dot product one, actually turned out to work a bit better, which is interesting. Um, this particular version here, if you call collab learner and pass use nn equals true, um, then what that's going to do is it's going to use this version, the version with the uh, um, concatenation and the um, linear layers. So collab learner, use an n equals true, again we get about the same result as you'd expect because it's just a shortcut for this version. And it's interesting actually, um, we have a look at collab learner, it actually returns an object of type embedding nn, and it's kind of cool if you look inside the fastai source code or use the double question mark trick to see the source code for embedding nn, you'll see it's three lines of code. Um, how does that happen? Um, because we're using this thing called tabular model, um, which we will learn about um, in a moment. Uh, but basically this uh, neural net version of collaborative filtering is literally just a tabular model in which we pass no continuous variables and um, some embedding sizes. So we'll see that in a moment. Okay, so that is um, collaborative filtering, and again, take a look at the further research section in particular after you finish the questionnaire, um, because there's some really important next steps you can take to, to push your knowledge and your skills. So let's now move to Notebook 9, Tabula. And we're going to look at tabular modeling and do a deep dive. And let's start by talking about this idea that we were starting to see here, which is embeddings. And specifically, let's move beyond just having embeddings for users and items, but embeddings for any kind of categorical variable. So really, because we know an embedding is just a lookup into an array, um, it can handle um, any kind of discrete categorical data. So things like age are not discrete. They're continuous numerical data, but something like uh, sex or postcode um, are categorical variables. Um, they have a certain number of discrete levels, 
the number of discrete levels they have is called their cardinality. So to have a look at an example of a data set that contains both categorical and continuous variables, we're going to look at the Rossman sales competition that ran on Kaggle a few years ago. And so basically what's going to happen is we're going to see a table that contains information about various stores in Germany, and the goal will be to try and predict how many sales there's going to be uh, for each day in a couple of week period for each store. So one of the interesting uh, things about this competition is that one of the gold medalists used deep learning, and it was one of the earliest uh, known examples of a state-of-the-art deep learning tabular model. I mean, this is not long ago, maybe 2015 or something, um, but really this idea of creating state-of-the-art tabular models with deep learning has not been very common um, and for not very long. Um, you know, interestingly, compared to the other gold medalists in this competition, um, the folks that used deep learning used a lot less feature engineering and a lot less domain expertise. And so they wrote a paper called Entity Embeddings of Categorical Variables, um, in which they basically described the exact thing that you saw in, the, in Notebook 8, the way you can think of one-hot encodings as just being embeddings, you can catenate them together, and you can put them through a couple of layers, uh, um, they call them dense layers, we call them linear layers, um, and create a neural network out of that. So this is really uh, a neat, you know, but kind of simple and obvious in hindsight trick. And they actually did exactly what we did in the paper, which is to look at the results of the trained embeddings. And so for example, they had an embedding matrix for um, uh, regions in Germany. Uh, because there, was, well, there wasn't really metadata about this, these were just learnt embeddings, just like we learnt embeddings about movies. And so then they um, just created, uh, just like we did before, um, a chart where they popped each region according to, I think probably a PCA, uh, of their embeddings. And then if you circle the ones that are close to each other in blue, you'll see that they're actually close to each other in Germany. And ditto for red, and ditto for green. And then here's the brown. So this is like pretty amazing is the way that we can see that it's kind of learnt something about what Germany looks like uh, based entirely on the purchasing behavior of people in those states. Something else they did was to look at every store and they looked at the um, distance between stores in practice, like how many kilometers away they are. And then they looked at the distance between stores in terms of their embedding distance, just like we saw in the previous notebook. And there was this very strong correlation that stores that were close to each other physically ended up having close embeddings as well, even though the actual location of these stores in physical space was not part of the model. Ditto with days of the week, so the days of the week were another um, embedding, and the days of the week that were next to each other ended up next to each other in embedding space, and ditto for months of the year. So pretty fascinating the way kind of information about the world ends up captured just by looking at training embeddings, which as we know are just um, index lookups into an array. Um, so the way we then combine these categorical variables, with these embeddings, with continuous variables, um, what was done in both the, um, the entity embedding paper that we just looked at, and then also described in more detail uh, in, by Google when they described how their recommendation system in Google Play works, uh, this is from uh, Google's paper, is they have the categorical features that go through the embeddings, and then there are continuous features and then all the embedding results and the continuous features are just concatenated together into this big concatenated table that then goes through, in this case, three layers of a neural net. And interestingly, they also take the um, kind of uh, collaborative filtering bit and do the dot product as well and combine the two. So they use both of the tricks we used in the previous notebook and combine them together. So that's the basic idea we're going to be seeing for 
um, moving beyond just collaborative filtering, which is just uh, two categorical variables, to as many categorical and as many continuous variables as we like. But before we do that, um, let's take a step back and think about other approaches. Because as I mentioned, the idea of deep learning as a kind of a best practice for tabular data is still pretty new, and it's still kind of controversial. Um, it's certainly not always the case that it's the best approach. Uh, so when we're not using deep learning, what would we be using? Well, what we'd probably be using is something called an ensemble of decision trees. And the two most popular are random forests and uh, gradient boosting machines or something similar. So basically between multi-layered neural networks learned with SGD and ensembles of decision trees, that kind of covers the vast majority of approaches that you're likely to see uh, for tabular data. And so we're going to make sure we cover them both, of course, today, in fact. So although deep learning is nearly always clearly superior for stuff like images and audio and natural language text, um, these two approaches tend to give somewhat similar results a lot of the time uh, for tabular data. So let's take a look. Some, you know, you really should generally try both and see which works best for you for each problem you look at. Why does the range go from 0 to 5.5 .5 if the maximum is 5? Um, that's a great question. Um, the reason is if you think about it for sigmoid, it's um, actually impossible for a sigmoid to get all the way to the top or all the way to the bottom. Those are asymptotes. So no matter how far, how big your x is, it can never quite get to the top, or no matter how small it is, it can never quite get to the top. So if you want to be able to actually predict a rating of 5, then you need to use something higher than 5 for your maximum. Are embeddings used only for highly cardinal categorical variables, or is this approach used in general? For low cardinality, can one use a simple one-hot encoder? I'll remind you, cardinality is the number of discrete levels in a variable. Um, and, um, and remember that um, an embedding is just a computational shortcut for a one-hot encoding. So there's really no reason to use a one-hot encoding, because it's, um, uh, as long as you have more than two levels, it's always going to be uh, more memory and lower, and give you exactly mathematically the same thing. And if there's just two levels, then it is basically identical. So there, there isn't really any reason not to use it. Thank you for those great questions. Um, okay, so one of the most important things about decision tree ensembles is that um, at the current state of the technology, they do provide uh, faster and easier ways of interpreting the model. Um, I think that's rapidly improving for deep learning models on tabular data, but that's where we are right now. Um, they also require rest, less hyperparameter tuning, um, so they're easier to kind of get right the first time. So my first approach for analyzing a new tabular data set is always an ensemble of decision trees. And specifically, I pretty much always start with a random forest, because it's just so reliable. Um, yes? Your experience for highly imbalanced data, such as broad or medical data, uh, what usually works best out of random forest, XGBoost, or neural network? Um, I'm not sure that the, whether the data is balanced or unbalanced is a key reason for choosing one of those above the others. I would try all of them and see which works best. Um, so the exception to the guideline about start with decision tree ensembles is your first thing to try would be if there's some very high cardinality categorical variables, then they can be a bit difficult to get to work really well in decision tree ensembles. Um, uh, or if there's something like, most importantly, if it's like plain text data or image data or audio data or something like that, um, then you're definitely going to need to use um, a neural net in there. But you could actually ensemble it with a random forest, as we'll see. Um, okay, so clearly we're going to need to understand how decision tree ensembles work. Um, so PyTorch isn't a great choice for decision tree ensembles. They're really designed for 
gradient-based methods and um, random forests and decision tree growing are not really gradient-based methods in the same way. Um, so instead we're going to use a library called scikit-learn, um, which is referred to as sklearn uh, as a module. Uh, scikit-learn does a lot of things. Um, we're only going to touch on a tiny piece of them, stuff we need to do um, to train uh, decision trees and random forests. Um, we've already mentioned before Wes McKinney's book, um, also a great book for understanding more about scikit-learn. So the data set for learning about um, decision tree ensembles is going to be another data set. It's, going to, it's called um, the uh, Blue Book for Bulldozers data set, and it's a Kaggle competition. So Kaggle competitions are fantastic. Um, they are um, um, machine learning competitions where you get interesting data sets, you get feedback on whether your approach is any good or not. You can see on a leaderboard what approaches are working best, and then you can read blog posts from the winning contestants sharing tips and tricks. Um, it's certainly not a substitute for actual um, um, practice doing end-to-end -end data science projects, uh, but for becoming good at creating predictive models that are predictive, um, it's a really fantastic resource, highly recommended. And you can uh, also submit to old, most old competitions um, to see how you would have gone without having to worry about you know, the kind of stress of like whether people will be looking at your results um, because they're not publicized uh, or published if you do that. Um, there's a, yes. There's a question. Sure. Can you comment on real-time applications of random forest? My experience, they tend to be too slow for real-time use cases like a recommender system. Neural network is much faster when run on the right hardware. Well, let's get to that once we see what they are, <laughs> shall we? Um, uh, now, you can't just um, download and untar Kaggle data sets using the untar data thing that we have in FastAI. So you actually have to sign up to Kaggle and then follow these instructions for how to download um, uh, data from Kaggle. Make sure you replace creds here with what it describes. You need to get a special API code and then run this one time to put that up on your server. And now you can um, use Kaggle to download data using the API. So uh, after we do that, we're going to end up with a bunch of, as you see, CSV files. Um, so let's take a look at this data. So the main data, uh, the main table is train.csv. Remember that's comma separated values. And the training set contains information such as the unique identifier of a sale, the unique identifier of a machine, the sale price, the sale date. Um, so what's going on here is one row of the data represents a, sing a, a sale of a single piece of heavy machinery, like a bulldozer, um, at an auction. So it happens at a date, as a price, it's of some particular piece of equipment, and so forth. So if we use pandas again to read in the CSV file, um, let's combine training and valid together. Uh, we can then look at the columns to see there's a lot of columns there, and many things which I don't know what the hell they mean, like blade extension and pad type and ride control. Um, but the good news is we're going to show you a way that you don't have to look at every single column and understand what they mean. Um, and random forests are going to help us with that as well. So once again, we're going to be seeing this idea that models can actually help us with data understanding and data cleanup. Um, one thing we can look at is ordinal columns, a good place to look at that now. If there's things there that you know are discrete values but have some order, like product size, it has medium and small and large, medium and many, these should not be in um, you know, alphabetical order or some random order, they should be in this specific order, right? They, they, they have a specific ordering. Um, so we can um, use uh, as type to turn it into a categorical variable, and then we can say set categories ordered equals true um, to basically say this is an ordinal column. So it's got discrete values, but we actually want to define what the order of the classes are. Um, we need to choose which is the dependent variable, and we do that by looking on Kaggle. And Kaggle will tell us that the thing we're meant to be predicting is sale price, 
And actually specifically, they'll tell us the thing we're meant to be predicting is the log of sale price, because root mean squared log error is the is the um, what we're actually going to be judged on in the competition. So we take the log. So we're just going to replace sale price with its log, and that's what we'll be using from now on. So a decision tree ensemble requires decision trees. So let's start by looking at decision trees. So a decision tree um, in uh, in in this case is a something that asks a series of binary that is yes or no questions about data. So such as is somebody less than or greater than, less than thirty? Yes, they are. Are they eating healthily? Yes, they are. And so okay, then we're going to say they are fit or unfit. Um, so like there's an example of some arbitrary decision tree that somebody might have come up with. It's a series of binary yes and no choices, and at the bottom are leaf nodes that make some prediction. Now of course, um, for our um, bulldozers competition, we don't know what binary questions to ask about these things, and in what order, um, in order to make a prediction about sale price. So we're doing machine learning, so we're going to try and come up with some automated way to create the questions. And there's actually a really simple procedure for doing that. You have a think about it. So if you want to kind of stretch yourself here, have a think about what's an automatic procedure that you can come up with that would automatically build a decision tree where the final answer would do a you know significantly better than random job of estimating the sale price um, of one of these auctions. All right, so here's um, here's the approach that we could use. Loop through each column of the data set. So we're going to go through each of, well, obviously not sale price, that's a dependent variable. Sale ID, machine ID, auctioneer, year made, etc. And so one of those will be, for example, product size. And so then what we're going to do is we're going to loop through each possible value of product size, large, large, medium, medium, etc. And then we're going to do a split basically like where this comma is, and we're going to say, okay, let's get all of the auctions of large um, equipment and put that into one group, and everything that's smaller than that and put that into another group. And so that's here, split the data into two groups based on whether they're greater than or less than that value. Um, if it's a categorical non-ordinal value, a variable, it'll be just whether it's equal or not equal to that level. And then we're going to uh, find the average sale price for each of the two groups. So for the large group, what was the average sale price? For the smaller than large group, what was the average sale price? And that will be our model. Our prediction will simply be the average sale price for that group. And so then you can say, well how good is that model? If our model was just to ask a single question with a yes no answer, put things into two groups and take the average of the group as being our prediction, and we can say, how good would that model be? What would be the root mean squared error from that model? And so we can then say, all right, how good would it be if we used large as a split? And then let's try again. What if we did large slash medium as a split? What if we did medium as a split? And so in each case, we can find the root mean squared error of that incredibly simple model. And then once we've done that for all of the product size levels, we can go to the next column and look at. Um, have a look, usage band, and do every level of usage band, and then state, every level of state, and so forth. And so there'll be some variable and some split level which gives the best root mean squared error of, of this really, really simple model. And so then we'll say, okay, that would be our first binary decision. It gives us two groups, and then we're going to take each one of those groups separately and create find another single binary decision for each of those two groups using exactly the same procedure. So then we'll have four groups, and then we'll do exactly the same thing again separately for each of those four groups, and so forth. So let's see what that looks like. And in fact, once we've gone through this, you might even want to see if you can implement this algorithm yourself. Um, it's not trivial. 
um, but it doesn't require any special coding skills, um, so hopefully you can find you, you'll be able to do it. Um, there's a few things we have to do before we can actually create a decision tree in terms of just some basic data munging. One is if we're going to take advantage of dates, we actually want to call fastai's add date part function. And what that does, as you see, after we call it, is it creates a whole different, a bunch of different uh, bits of metadata from that data, say your year, say your month, say your week, say your day, and so forth. So um, sale date of itself doesn't have a whole lot of information um, directly, but we can pull a lots of different information out of it. And so this is an example of something called feature engineering, which is where we take some piece, uh, some piece of data and we try to grab, create lots of, other, lots of other pieces of data from it. So is this particular date the end of a month or not? Is it the end of a year or not? And so forth. So that handles dates. Um, there's a bit more cleaning we want to do, and FastAI provides some things to make cleaning easier. Uh, we can use the tabular pandas class to create a tabular data set using pandas. And specifically we're going to use two tabular processes, or tabular procs. A tabular processor is basically just a transform, and we've seen transforms before, so go back and remind yourself what a transform is, um, except it's just slightly different, it's like three lines of code, if you look at the code for it. Um, it's actually going to modify the object in place, rather than creating a new object and giving it back to you. And that's because often these tables of data are kind of really big, and we don't want to waste um, lots of RAM. Um, and it's just going to run the transform once and save the result, rather than doing it lazily when you access it. Uh, for the same reason, we're just going to make this a lot faster. So. Um, you can just think of them as transforms, really. So one of them is called Categorify, and Categorify is going to replace a column with numeric categories, using the same basic idea of like a vocab, like we've seen before. Fill missing is going to find any columns with missing data, and it's going to fill in the missing data with the median of the data, and create a new column, a new Boolean column, which is set to true for anything that was missing. So these two things is basically enough to get you to a point where most of the time you'll be able to train a model. Now the next thing we need to do is think about our validation set. Um, as we discussed in lesson one, a random validation set is not always appropriate. And certainly for something like predicting um, auction results, it almost certainly is not appropriate. Because we're going to be wanting to use a model in the future, um, not at some random date in the past. So the way this Kaggle competition was set up was that the, the test set, the thing that you had to fill in and submit to the competition, was um, two weeks of data that was after any of the training set. So we should do the same thing for a validation set. We should create something which is where the validation set is the last couple of weeks of data. Um, and, uh, and so then the training set will only be data before that. So we basically can do that by grabbing everything before um, October 2011, uh, create our training and validation set based on that condition, and grabbing those bits. Um, so that's going to split our training set and validation set by date, not randomly. Um, we're also going to need to tell when you um, create a tabular pandas object, you're going to be passing in a data frame, you're going to be passing in your tabular procs, and you also have to say, what are my categorical and continuous variables? We can use uh, FastAI's cont cat split to automatically split a data frame to continuous and categorical variables for you. So we can just pass those in. Uh, tell it what, um, what is the dependent variable, you can have more than one, and what are the indexes to split into training and valid. And this is a tabular object, so it's got all the information you need about the training set, the validation set, categorical and continuous variables, and the dependent variable, and any processes to run. Um, it looks a lot like a data sets object, so it has a dot train, it has a dot valid, and so if we have a look um, at dot show, we can see the, the data. 
Um, but dot show is going to show us the kind of the string data. But if we look at dot items, you can see internally it's actually stored these very compact numbers, which we can use directly in a model. So FastAI has basically got us to a point here where we have our data into a format um, ready for modeling and our validation sets being created um, to see how these numbers relate to these strings. We can again, just like we saw uh, last week, use the classes attribute, which is a dictionary, which basically tells us the vocab. So this is how we look up, for example, 6 is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is compact example. Um, that processing took, uh, takes a little while to run, so you can go ahead and save the tabular object, and so then you can load it back later without having to rerun all the processing. So that's a nice kind of fast way to quickly get back up and running without having to reprocess your data. So we've done the basic data munging we need, so we can now create a decision tree, and in scikit-learn, a decision tree where the dependent variable is continuous is a decision tree regressor. And let's start by telling it we just want a total of four leaf nodes. We'll see what that means in a moment. And in scikit-learn you generally call fit, so it looks quite a lot like fastai, and you pass in your independent variables and your dependent variable, and we can grab those straight from our tabular object training set. There's .xs and dot y, and we can do the same thing for validation, just to save us some typing. Okay, question. Do you have any thoughts on what data augmentation for tabular data might look like? Um, I don't have a great sense of uh, data augmentation for tabular data. Um, we'll be seeing later, either in this course or in the next part, um, drop out and mix up and stuff like that, which there might be opportunities to do that in later layers in a tabular model. Otherwise I think you'd need to think about kind of the semantics of the data and think about what are things you could do to change the data without changing the meaning. Sounds like a pretty tricky route. Their question, does FastAI distinguish between ordered categories such as low, medium, high? and unordered categorical variables. Like yes, that, that was that ordinal thing I told you about before. And all it really does is it ensures that your um, classes list has a specific order, so then these numbers actually have a specific order. And as you'll see, that's actually going to turn out to be pretty important for how we train our random forest. Okay, so we can create a decision tree regressor, we can fit it, um, and then we can draw it the fastai function, um, and here is the decision tree we just trained. Uh, and, we, and behind the scenes, this actually used the, basically the exact process that we described back here, right? So this is where you can like try and create your own decision tree implementation if you're interested in stretching yourself. Um, so we're going to use one that already uh, exists, and the best way to understand what it's done is to look at this diagram from top to bottom. So the first step is it says like, okay, the initial model it created is a model with no binary splits at all. Specifically, it's always going to predict the value 10.1 for every single row. Why is that? Well, because this is the simplest possible model, is to take the average of the dependent variable and always predict that. And so this is always should be your kind of, pretty much your basic baseline for regression. Uh, there are 404,710 rows, auctions, that we're averaging, and the mean squared error of this incredibly simple model, in which there are no rules at all, no groups at all, just a single average, is a 0.48. So then, the next most complex model is to take a single column, coupler system, and a single binary decision, is coupler system less than or equal to 0.5? True, there are 360,847 um, auctions where it's true, 
and 43,863 where it's false. And now interestingly, in the false case, you can see that there are no further binary decisions. So this is called a leaf node. It's a node where this is as far as you can get, and so if your coupler system is not less than or equal to 0.5, then the prediction this model makes for your sale price is 9.21, uh, versus if it's true, it's 10.21. So you can see it's actually found a very big difference here, and that's why it picked this as the first binary split. And so the mean squared error for this section here is 0.12, which is far better than we started out at, 0.48. This group still has 360,000 in it, and so it does another binary split. This time is the year that this um, piece of equipment made, was it less than or equal to 1991 and a half? If it was, if it's true, then we get a leaf node, and the prediction is 9.97, mean squared error 0.37. If the value is false, we don't have a leaf node, and we have another binary split. And you can see eventually we get down to here, coupler system true, year made false, product size false, mean squared error 0.17. So all of these leaf nodes have MSCs that are smaller than that uh, original baseline model of just taking the mean. So this is how you can grow a decision tree. And we only stopped here because we said max leaf nodes is four. One, two, three, four, right? And so if we want to keep training it further, we can just use a higher number. Um, there's actually a very nice um, uh, library by Terence Park called DTreeViz, um, which can show us exactly the same information like so. And so here are the same leaf nodes, one, two, three, four, and you can see the kind of the chart of how many are there, this is the split, coupler system 0.5, here are the two groups, you can see the sale price in each of the two groups, and then here's the leaf node, and so then the second split was on year made, and you can see here something weird's going on with year made, there's a whole bunch of year maids that are a thousand, which is obviously not a sensible <laughs> year for a bulldozer to be made. So presumably that's some kind of missing value. Um, so when we look at the kind of the picture like this, it can give us some insights about what's going on in our data. And so maybe we should um, replace those thousands with 1950, because that's you know obviously a very, very early year for a bulldozer. Um, so we can kind of pick it arbitrarily. It's actually not really going to make any difference to the model that's created. Um, because all we care about is the order, because we're just doing these binary splits, but it'll make it easier to look at, as you can see. see here's our 1950s now, and so now it's much easier to see what's going on in that binary split. So let's now get rid of max leaf nodes and build a bigger decision tree. And then let's just, for the rest of this um, uh, notebook, create a couple of little functions, one to create the root mean squared error, which is just here, and another one to take a model and some independent independent variables, predict from the model on the independent variables, and then take the root mean squared error with a dependent variable. So that's going to be our model's root mean squared error. So for this decision tree, in which we didn't have a stopping criteria, so as many leaf nodes as you like, the model's root mean squared error is zero. So we've just built the perfect model. So this is great news, right? We've built the perfect auction trading system. Well, remember, we actually need to check the validation set. So let's check the check MRMSE with the validation set, and oh, it's worse than zero. So our training set is zero, our validation set is much worse than zero. Why has that happened? Well, one of the things that a random forest in sklearn can do is it can tell you the number of leaf nodes, the number of leaves, there are 341,000. Number of data points, 400,000. So in other words, we have nearly as many leaf nodes as data points. So most of our leaf nodes only have a single thing in, so they're taking an average of a single thing. And clearly this makes no sense at all. So what we should actually do is pick some different stopping criteria, and let's say, okay, if you get a leaf node with 25 things or less in it, don't, 
don't split, or don't split things to create a leaf node with less than 25 things in it. And now if we fit, and we look at the root mean squared error for the validation set, it's going to go down from 0.33 to 0.32. So the training sets got worse from 0 to 0 0.248. The validation sets got better, and now we only have 12,000 leaf nodes. So that is much more reasonable. All right, so let's take a five minute break, and then we're going to come back and see how we get the best of both worlds. How are we going to get something which has the kind of flexibility um, to get these, uh, you know, what we're not going to get down to zero, um, but to get, you know, uh, really deep trees, um, but also uh, without overfitting. And the trick will be to use something called bagging. We'll come back and talk about that in five minutes. Okay, welcome back. So um, we're going to look at how we can get the best of both worlds, as we discussed. And let's start by uh, having a look at what we're doing with categorical variables, first of all. And so you might notice that um, previously with categorical variables, for example, in collaborative filtering, we had to um, you know, kind of think about like how many embedding levels we have, for example. If you've used other modeling tools, you might have experienced things with creating dummy variables, stuff like that. Um, for random forests on the whole, you don't have to. Um, the, the reason is that, as we've seen, uh, all of our categorical variables have been turned into numbers. And so we can perfectly well have um, decision tree binary decisions which use those particular numbers. Now, the numbers might not be ordered in any interesting way, but if there's a particular level which uh, kind of stands out as being important, it only takes two um, binary splits to split out that level into a single, uh, uh, you know, into a single piece. Um, so generally speaking, I don't normally worry too much about kind of encoding um, categorical variables in a special way. As I mentioned, I do try to uh, encode ordinal variables by saying what the order of the levels is, because uh, often, as you would expect, sizes, for example, you know, medium and small are, are going to be kind of next to each other, and large and extra large would be next to each other. So it's good to have those as similar numbers. Um, having said that, um, you can kind of one hot encode. Uh, a categorical variable if you want to, using get dummies in pandas. Um, but there's not a lot of uh, evidence that that actually helps. There's actually, that has been stored in a paper. Um, and so I would say in general for categorical variables, don't worry about it too much, just use what we've shown you. Do you have a question? Uh, for, for ordinal c categorical variables, how do you deal with uh, when they have like NA or uh, uh, missing values, where do you put that in the order? Um, so in uh, FastAI, NA missing values always appear as the first item. They'll always be the zero in the item. And also if you get something in the validation or test set, which is a level we haven't seen in training, that will be considered to be that missing or NA value as well. All right. so. Um, what we're going to do to try and improve our random forest is we're going to use something called bagging. And this was developed by a retired Berkeley professor named Leo Bryman in 1994, and <laughs> he did a lot of great work, and perhaps you could argue that most of it happened after he retired. Um, his technical report was called Bagging Predictors, and he described how you could create multiple versions of a predictor, so multiple different models. Um, and you could then aggregate them by averaging over the predictions. And specifically, um, the way he suggested doing this was to create what he called bootstrap replicates. In other words, uh, randomly select different subsets of, of your data, uh, train a model on that subset, kind of store it away as one of your predictors, and then do it again a bunch of times. And so each of these models is trained on a different random subset of your data. And then you um, 
to, to predict, you predict on all of those different versions of your model and average them. Um, and uh, it turns out that um, bagging works really well. So this, the sequence of steps is basically uh, randomly choose some subset of rows, train a model using that subset, save that model, and then return to step one, do that a few times to train a few models, and then to make a prediction, predict with all the models, and take the average. That is bagging. And it's very simple, but it's astonishingly powerful. And the reason why is that each of these models we've trained, um, although they are not using all of the data, um, so they're kind of less accurate than a model that uses all of the data, um, each of them is, the errors are not correlated um, you know, the, the errors because of using that smaller subset are not correlated with the errors of the other models because they're random subsets. And so when you take the average of a bunch of um, kind of um, errors which are not correlated with each other, um, the average of those errors is zero. So therefore the average of the models uh, should give us an accurate prediction of the thing we're actually trying to predict. So, um, as I say here, it's an amazing result. We can improve the accuracy of nearly any kind of algorithm by training it multiple times on different random subsets of data and then averaging the predictions. Um, so then Breiman in 2001 showed a way to do this specifically for decision trees, where not only did he randomly choose a subset of rows for each model, but then for each binary split, he also randomly selected a subset of columns, and this is called the random forest. And it's perhaps the most widely used, most practically important machine learning method, um, and astonishingly simple. Um, to create a random forest regressor, you use sklearn's random forest regressor. Um, if you pass n jobs minus one, it will use all of the CPU cores that you have to run as fast as possible. N estimators says how many trees, how many models to train. Max samples says how many rows to use, uh, randomly chosen rows to use in each one. Max features is how many uh, randomly chosen columns to use for each binary split point. Uh, min samples leaf is the stopping criteria, um, and we'll come back to. So here's a little function that will create a random forest regressor and fit it to some set of independent variables and a dependent variable. So we can give it a few um, default values and create a random forest and train. And our validation set, uh, our MSE is 0.23. If we compare that to what we had before, we had 0.32, so dramatically better um, uh, by using a random forest. Um, so, so what's happened when we um, called random forest regressor is it's just using that decision tree builder that we've already seen, but it's building multiple versions with these different random subsets, and for each binary split it does, it's also randomly selecting a subset of columns. And then when we create a prediction, it is averaging the predictions of each of the trees. And as you can see, it's giving a really great result. And one of the amazing things we'll find is that um, it's going to be hard for us to improve this very much. <laughs> you know, the kind of the default starting point tends to turn out to be pretty great. Um, the, the SK Learn docs have lots of good information in. One of the things it has is this nice picture that shows as you increase the number of estimators, how does the um, accuracy improve, the uh, error rate improves for different max features levels. Um, and in general, the more trees you add, um, the more accurate your model. They're, they're, it's not going to overfit, right? Because it's, it's averaging more of these. Um, uh, these weak models, more of these models that are trained on subsets of the data. So train as many, use as many estimators as you like, 
um, really just a case of how much time do you have and whether you kind of reach a point where it's not really improving anymore. You can actually get at the underlying decision trees in a model, in a random forest model, using estimators underscore. So with a list comprehension, we can call predict on each individual tree. And so here's an array, a NumPy array, containing the predictions from each individual tree for each row in our data. So if we take the mean across the zero axis, we'll get exactly the same number. Because remember, that's what a random forest does, is it takes the mean of the trees, predictions. So one cool thing we could do is we could look at the 40 estimators we have and grab the predictions for the first i of those trees and take their mean. And then we can find the root mean squared error. And so in other words, here is the accuracy when you've just got one tree, two trees, three trees, four trees, five trees, etc. And you can see, so it's kind of nice, right? You can, you can actually create your own, kind of build your own tools to look inside these things and see what's going on. And so we can see here that as you add more and more trees, the accuracy did indeed keep improving, or the root mean squared error kept improving, although it, the, the improvement slowed down after a while. Um, the validation set is worse than the training set, and there's a couple of reasons that could have happened. The first reason could be because we're still overfitting, which is not necessarily a problem, it's just something we could identify. Uh, or maybe it's because the, um, the fact that we're trying to predict the last two weeks is actually a problem and that the last two weeks are kind of different to the other auctions in our data set. Maybe something changed over time. So how do we tell which of those two reasons there are? What, what is the reason that our validation set is worse? We can actually find out using a very clever trick called out of bag error, OOB error. And we use OOB error for lots of things. Um, you can grab the OOB error, um, uh, well, you can grab the OOB predictions from the model with OOB prediction, and you can grab the RMSE, and you can find that the OOB error, uh, RS, RMSE is 0.21, which is quite a bit better than 0.23. So let me explain what OOB error is. What OOB error is, is we look at um, each uh, row of the training set, not the validation set, each row of the training set, and we say, so if we say, we say for row number one, um, which trees included row number one in the training? And we'll say, okay, let's not use those um, for calculating the error, because it was part of those trees training. So we'll just calculate the error for that row using the trees where that row was not included in training that tree. Because remember, every tree is using only a subset of the data. So we do that for every row. We find the prediction using only the trees that were not used, um, that, that that row was not used. Uh, and those are the OOB predictions. So in other words, this is like giving us a validation set result um, without actually needing a validation. Um, but the thing is, it's not with that time offset, it's not looking at the last two weeks, it's looking at the whole training set. So this basically tells us how much of the error is due to overfitting versus due to being the last couple of weeks. So that's a cool trick. OOB error is something that very quickly kind of gives us a sense of how much we're, we're overfitting. And we don't even need a validation set to do it. So there's our OOB error. Um, so that's telling us a bit about what's going on in our model. Um, but then there's a lot of things we'd like to find out from our model. And I've got five things in particular here which I generally find pretty interesting. Which is, how confident are we about our predictions for some particular prediction we're making? Like we can say this is what we think the prediction is, but how confident are we? Is that exactly that or is it just about that, or we really have no idea. 
And then for, predict for predicting a particular um, item, which factors were the most important in that prediction, and how did they influence it? Overall, which columns are making the biggest difference in Ampital? Which ones could we maybe throw away and it wouldn't matter? Which columns are basically redundant with each other, uh, so we don't really need both of them? And as we vary some column, how does it change the prediction? So those are the five things that, we're, that I'm interested in figuring out, and we can do all of those things with a random forest. Let's start with the first one. So the first one, we've already seen that we can grab all of the predictions for all of the trees, and take their mean to get the actual predictions of the model, and then to get the RMSE. But what if instead of saying mean, we did exactly the same thing, like so, but instead it said standard deviation. This is going to tell us, for every row in our data set, how much did the trees vary? And so, if our model really had never seen kind of data like this before, it, it was something where, you know, different trees were giving very different predictions, it might give us a sense that maybe um, this is something that we're not at all confident about. And as you can see, when we look at the standard deviation of the trees for each prediction, let's just look at the first five, they vary a lot, right? 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.09, 0 nearly 0 0.3, okay? So this is um, a really interesting, it's not something that a lot of people talk about, but I think it's a really interesting approach to kind of figuring out um, whether we might want to be cautious about a particular prediction because maybe we're not very confident about it. So there's one thing we can easily do with a random forest. The next thing, and this is I think the most important thing for me in terms of interpretation, is feature importance. Here's what feature importance looks like. We can call feature importance on a model with some independent variables. Let's say grab the first 10. And this says these are the 10 most important features in this random forest. These are the things that are the most strongly driving sale price. Or we could plot them. And so you can see here, there's just a few things that are by far the most important. What year? the uh, equipment was made, bulldozer or whatever, how big is it, coupler system, whatever that means, and the product class, whatever that means. Um, and so you can um, get this by simply looking inside your train model and grabbing the feature importances attribute. And so here for making it better to print out, I'm just sticking that into a data frame and sorting Descending by importance. So how is this actually being done? Um, it's, it's actually really neat. What Scikit-Learn does, um, and, and Bryman, uh, the inventor of Random Forest, described, is that you can go through each tree, and then start at the top of the tree and look at each branch, and at each branch see what feature was used to split, which binary, which the binary split was based on which column, and then how much better was the model after that split compared to beforehand. And we basically then say, okay, that column was responsible for that amount of improvement. And so you add that up across all of the um, splits, across all of the trees for each column, and then um, you normalize it so they all add to one, and that's what gives you these numbers, which we show the first few of them in this table, and the first 30 of them here in this chart. So this is something that's fast, and it's easy, and it kind of gives us a good sense of like, well, maybe the stuff that are less than 0.005 we could remove. So if we did that, that would leave us with only 21 columns. So let's try that. Let's just, um, let's just say, okay, X's which are important are the X's which are in this list of ones to keep. Do the same, they're valid. Uh, retrain our random forest, and have a look at the result, and basically our accuracy is about the same. Um, but we've gone down from 78 columns 
the 21 column. So I think this is really important. It's not just about creating the most accurate model you can, but you want to kind of be able to fit it in your head as best as possible. And so 21 columns is going to be much easier for us to check for any data issues and understand what's going on. And the accuracy is about the same, or the, the, the RMSE. Um, so I, I would say, okay, let's do that. Let's just stick with X is important from now on. And so here's this entire set of the 21 features. And you can see it looks now like year made and product size are the two really important things. And then there's a cluster of kind of mainly product related things that are kind of at the next level of importance. Um, one of the tr tricky things here is that we've got like uh, product class desk, model ID, secondary desk, model desk, base model, they, model descriptor, they all look like they might be similar ways of saying the same thing. So one thing that can help us to interpret the feature importance better and understand better what's happening in the model um, is to remove uh, redundant features. So uh, one way to do that is to call FastAI's cluster columns, which is basically a thin wrapper for stuff that Scikit-Learn already provides. And what that's going to do is it's going to find pairs of columns which are very similar. So you can see here sale year and sale lapsed. See how this line is way out to the right, or else machine ID and model ID is not at all, it's way out to the left. So that means that sale year and sale elapsed are very, very similar. When one is low, the other tends to be low, and vice versa. Here's a group of three, which all seem to be much the same. And then product group desk and product group, and then FI best base model and FI model desk. So these all seem like things where maybe we could remove one of each of these pairs, because they're basically seem to be much the same. You know, they're, they're, very, they're you know, they're when one is high, the other is high, and vice versa. Um, so let's um, try removing one of each of these. Now it takes a little while to train a random forest, and so for the just to see whether removing something makes it much worse, we could just do a very fast version. So we could just train something uh, where we only have fifty thousand rows per tree, train for each tree. Um, and we'll just use 40 trees. Um, and let's then just get the OOB score. And so for that um, fast, simple version, our basic OOB with our important Xs is 0 0.877. And here for OOB, a higher number is better. So then let's try going through each of the things we thought we might not need and try dropping them, and then getting the OOB error for our X's with that one column removed. And so compared to 877, most of them don't seem to hurt very much. They all elapsed hurt quite a bit. Right? So for each of those um, groups, let's go and see which one of the ones seems like we could remove it. So here's the five I found. Let's remove the whole lot and see what happens. And so the OOB went from 877 to 874, so hardly any difference at all, um, despite the fact we managed to get rid of five of our variables. So let's create something called X's final, which is the X is important, and then dropping those five. Uh, save them for later. We can always load them back again. And then let's check our random forest using those. And again, 0.233 or 0.234. So we've got about the same thing, but we've got um, even less columns now. So we're getting a kind of a simpler and simpler model without hurting our accuracy, which is great. So the next thing we said um, we were interested in learning about is for the columns that are, particularly the columns that are most important, um, how does What's the relationship between that column and the dependent variable? So, for example, what's the relationship between product size and sale price? So, the first thing I would do would be just to look at 
a histogram. So one way to do that is with a value counts um, in um, pandas. Um, and we can see here our different um, levels of product size. And one thing to note here is actually missing uh, is actually the most common. And then next most is compact and small, and then mini is pretty tiny. So we can uh, do the same thing for year made. Um, now for year made we can't just um, uh, see the, the basic bar chart, like here we recorded a histogram, it's not, it's a bar chart. Um, for year made we actually need a histogram, which um, Pandas has stuff like this built in, so we can just call histogram. And uh, that 1950, you remember we created it, that's kind of this missing value thing which used to be a thousand, um, but most of them seem to have been um, well into the 90s and 2000s. So let's now um, look at something called a partial dependence plot. I'll show it to you first. Um, here is a partial dependence plot of um, year made uh, against partial dependence. So what does this mean? Well, we should focus on the part where we actually have a reasonable amount of data, so at least well into the 80s, so around here. And so let's look at this bit here. Basically what this says is that as year made increases, the predicted um, uh, sale price, log sale price of course, also increases. You can see. And the log sale price is increasing linearly, so on other roughly. So roughly then this is actually an exponential relationship between year made and sale price. Um, why do we call it a partial dependence? Are we just plotting the kind of the year against the average sale price? Well, no, we're not. We can't do that because a lot of other things change from year to year. For example, maybe more recently people tend to buy bigger bulldozers or bulldo more bulldozers with air conditioning or um, more expensive models of bulldozers. And we really want to be able to say like, no, just what's the impact of year and nothing else? And if you think about it from a kind of a inflation point of view, um, you would expect that um, older uh, bulldozers would be kind of, um, uh, that bulldozers would get a kind of a constant ratio um, cheaper the further you go back, which is what we see. So what we really want to say is, all other things being equal, what happens if only the year changes? And there's a really cool way we can answer that question with a random forest. Um, so how does year made impact sale price, all other things being equal? So what we can do is we can go into our actual data set and replace every single value in the year made column with 1950, and then can calculate the predicted sale price for every single auction and then take the average over all the auctions. And that's what gives us this value here. And then we can do the same for 1951, 1952, and so forth, until eventually we get to our final year of 2011. So this isolates the effect of only year made. So it's a kind of a, a bit of a curious thing to do, but it's actually, it's a pretty neat trick of trying to kind of pull apart and create this partial dependence to say what might be the impact of just changing year made. Um, and we can do the same thing for product size. Right? And one of the interesting things if we do it for product size is we see that the lowest value of predicted sale price, log sale price, is NA, which is a bit of a worry because we kind of want to know, well, that means it's really important. The question of whether or not the product size is labeled is really important. And that is something that I would want to dig into before I actually use this model to find out, well, why is it that sometimes things aren't labeled and what does it mean? You know, why is it that that's actually a, such an um, important predictor? So that is the partial dependence plot, and it's a really clever trick. So we have looked at four of the five questions we said we wanted to answer at the start of this section. 
So the last one that we want to answer is this one here. We're predicting with a particular row of data what were the most important factors and how did they influence that prediction. This is quite related to the very first thing we saw. So it's like imagine you were using this auction price model in real life. You had something on your tablet and you went into some auction and you looked up what the predicted um, auction price would be for this uh, lot that's coming up to find out whether it seems like it's being under or overvalued and then you can decide what to do about that. So one thing we said we'd be interested to know is like, well, are we actually confident in our prediction? And then we might be curious to find out like, oh, I'm really surprised it was predicting such a high value. Why was it predicting such a high value? So to find the answer to that question, uh, we can use a module called Tree Interpreter. And Tree Interpreter, um, uh, the way it works is that you pass in a, a, a single row, so it's like here's the auction that's coming up, here's the, the model, here's the auctioneer ID, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Please predict the, um, the value um, from the random forest, what's the expected sale price. And then what we can do is we can take that one row of data and put it through the first decision tree. And we can see what's the first split that's selected. And then based on that split, does it end up increasing or decreasing the predicted um, price compared to that kind of raw baseline model of just take the average. And then you can do that again at the next split, and again at the next split, and again at the next split. So for each split, we see what the increase or decrease in the oh, <laughs> addiction, that's not right. Uh, we see what the increase or decrease um, in the prediction is. Fix that while I'm here. Um, compared to the parent node. And so then you can do that for every tree, and then add up the total change in importance by split variable. And that allows you to draw something like this. So here's something that's looking at one particular row of data, and overall we start at zero. And so zero is um, the initial 10.1. Do you remember this number? 10.1 is the average log sale price of the whole data set. They call it the bias tree interpreter. And so if we call that zero, then for this particular row we're looking at, year made has a negative 4.2 impact on the prediction. And then product size has a positive 0.2. Coupler system has a positive 0.046. Model ID has a positive 0.127 and so forth, right? And so the red ones are negative and the green ones are positive, and you can see how they all join up until eventually, overall, the prediction is that it's going to be negative 0.122 compared to 10.1, which is equal to 9.98. So this kind of plot is called a waterfall plot. Um, and so basically when we say treeinterpreter.predict, it gives us back the prediction, which is the actual number we get back from the random forest, the bias, which is just always this 10.1 for this data set, and then the contributions, which is all of these different values. It's how much, how important was each factor. And here I've used a threshold, which means um, Anything that was less than 0 0.08 all gets thrown into this other category. I think this is a really useful kind of thing to have in production um, because it can help you answer questions, whether it you know, be for the customer or for you know, whoever's using your model. If they're surprised about some prediction, why is that prediction? Uh, so I'm going to show you something um, really interesting using some synthetic data. And I want you to really have a think about why this is happening before I tell you. So and like pause the video if you're watching the video um, when I get to that point. Um, let's start by creating um, some synthetic data, like so. So uh, we're going to grab um, 40 values evenly spaced between 0 and 20. And then we're just going to create the uh, y equals x line. And add 
um, some normally distributed random jitter around that. So here's the scatter plot. So here's some data we want to try and predict. And we're going to use a random forest in a kind of bit of an overkill here. Um, now, um, in this case, we only have one independent variable. Um, Scikit-learn expects us to have more than one. Um, so we can use uh, unsqueeze in PyTorch to add, to go from a shape of 40, in other words, a vector with 40 elements, to a shape of 40, comma 1, in other words, a matrix of 40 rows with one column. So this unsqueeze 1 means add a unit axis here. Um, I don't use unsqueeze very often because I actually generally prefer the index with a special value none. This works in PyTorch and NumPy. And this, the way it works is to say, okay, xlin, remember that's size, it's a vector of length 40, every row, and then none means insert a unit axis here for the column. So these are two ways of doing the same thing, but this one is a little bit more flexible, so that's what I use more often. So now that we've got uh, the shape that it's expected, which is a rank 2 tensor, an array, or an array with two dimensions or axes, we can create a random forest, we can fit it, and let's just use the first 30 data points, right? So kind of stop here. And then let's do a prediction, right? So let's plot the original data points and then also plot a prediction. And look what happens on the prediction. It act it's kind of nice and accurate. And then suddenly, what happens? Okay, so this is the bit where if you're watching the video, I want you to pause and have a think, why is this flat? So, what's going on here? Well, remember, a random forest is just taking the average of predictions of a bunch of trees. And a tree, the prediction of a tree, is just the average of the values in a leaf node. And remember, we fitted using a training set containing only the first 30, so none of these appeared in the training set. So the highest we could get would be the average of values that are inside the training set. In other words, there's this maximum we can get to. So random forests cannot extrapolate outside of the bounds of the data that they've in the training set. This is going to be a huge problem for things like time series prediction where there's like an underlying trend, for instance. But really, it's more a more general issue than just time variables. It's going to be hard for random, or impossible often for random forests to just extrapolate outside the types of data that it's seen in a general sense. So we need to make sure that our validation set does not contain out-of-domain data. So how do we find out-of-domain data? So we might not even know if our test set is distributed in the same way as our training data. So if they're from two different time periods, how do you kind of tell how they vary, right? Or if it's a Kaggle competition, how do you tell if the test set and the training set which Kaggle gives you have some underlying differences? There's actually a cool trick you can do, which is you can create a column called isValid, which contains zero for everything in the training set and one for everything in the validation set. And it's concatenating all of the independent variables together. So, so, so it's concatenating the independent variables for both the training and validation set together. So this is our independent variable. And this becomes our dependent variable. And we're going to create a random forest, not for predicting price, but a random forest that predicts, is this row from the validation set or the training set? So if the validation set and the training set are from kind of the same distribution, if they're not different, then this random forest should basically have zero predictive power. If it has any predictive power, then it means that our training and validation set are different. And to find out the source of that difference, we can use feature importance. And so you can see here that the difference between the validation set and the training set is, not surprisingly, sale elapsed. So that's the number of days since, I think, like 1970 or something. So it's basically the date. So yes, of course you can predict whether something is 
in the validation set or the training set by looking at the date because that's actually how we defined them. That makes sense. This is interesting, sales ID. So it looks like the sales ID is not some random identifier, but it increases over time. And ditto for machine ID. And then there's some other smaller ones here that kind of make sense. Um, so I guess for something like model desk, I guess there are certain models that were only made in later years, for instance. Um, but you can see these top three columns are a bit of an issue. Um, so then we could say like, okay, what happens if we look at each one of those columns, those first three, and remove them, and then see how it changes our RMSC on our um, <coughs> sales price model on the validation set. So we start from point 232, and removing sales ID actually makes it a bit better. Sale elapsed makes it a bit worse, machine ID about the same. So we can probably remove sales ID and machine ID without losing any accuracy, and yep, it's actually slightly improved. But most importantly, it's going to be more resilient over time, right? Because we're trying to remove the time-related features. Another thing to note is that since it seems that, um, you know, this kind of sale elapsed issue that maybe it's making a big difference, is maybe looking at the sale year uh, distribution. This is the histogram. Most of the sales are in the last few years anyway. So what happens if we only include the most recent few years. So let's just include everything after 2004. So that is X's filtered. And if I train on that subset, then my accuracy goes improves a bit more from 231 to 230. So that's interesting, right? Um, we're actually using less data, less rows, and getting a slightly better result because the more recent data is more representative. So that's about as far as we can get with our random forest. Um, but uh, what I will say is this. This issue of extrapolation would not happen with a neural net, would it? Because a neural net is using the kind of the underlying layers are linear layers. And so linear layers can absolutely extrapolate. Um, so the obvious thing to think then at this point is, well, maybe would a neural net do a better job of this? That's going to be the thing next yep. after this question. Question first: How do um, how does feature importance relate to correlation? Um, feature importance doesn't particularly relate to correlation. Um, correlation is a concept for linear models, and this is not a linear model. So remember, feature importance is calculated by looking at the um, improvement in accuracy as you go down each tree and you go down each binary split. Um, if you're used to linear regression, then I guess correlation sometimes can be used as a measure of feature importance, um, but this is a much more kind of direct version that's um, taking account of these nonlinearities and interactions and stuff as well. So it's a much more a uh, flexible and reliable measure, generally speaking, feature importance. Any more questions? So to do the same thing with a neural network, I'm going to just copy and paste the same lines of code that I had from before, but this time I'll call it NN, DFNN, and these are the same lines of code. And I'll grab the same list of columns we had before in the dependent variable to get the same data frame. Now, as we've discussed, for categorical columns, we probably want to use embeddings. So to create embeddings, we need to know which columns should be treated as categorical variables. And as we've discussed, we can use cont cat split for that. One of the useful things we can pass that is the maximum cardinality. So max card equals 9,000 means if there's a column with more than 9,000 levels, you should treat it as continuous. And if it's got less than 9,000 levels, treat it as categorical. So that's, you know, it's a, it's a simple little function that just checks the cardinality and splits them based on how many discrete levels they have. And of course, their, their data type, if it's not um, actually a numeric data type, it has to be categorical. 
So there's our um, there's our split, um, and then from there, what we can do is we can say, oh, we've got to be a bit careful of sale elapsed because actually sale elapsed I think has less than nine thousand categories, but we definitely don't want to use that as a categorical variable. The whole point was to make it that this is something that we can extrapolate. So we certainly anything that's kind of time dependent or we think that we might see things outside the range of inputs um, in, the, in the training data, we should make them continuous variables. So let's make sale elapsed, put it in continuous neural net, and remove it from categorical. So here's the number of unique levels, this is from pandas, for everything in our neural net data set for the categorical variables. And I get a bit nervous when I see these really high numbers. Um, so I don't want to have too many things with uh, like lots and lots of categories. The reason I don't want lots of things with lots and lots of categories is just they're going to take up a lot of parameters because in an embedding matrix, this is you know every one of these is a row in an embedding matrix. In this case, I notice model ID and model desk might be describing something very similar. So I'd quite like to find out if I could get rid of one. And an easy way to do that would be to use a random forest. So let's try removing the model desk, um, and let's create a random forest, and let's see what happens. And oh, it's actually a tiny bit better, and certainly not worse. So that suggests that we can actually get rid of one of these levels, or one of these variables. So let's get rid of that one. And so now we can create a tabular pandas object just like before, but this time we're going to add one more processor, which is normalize. And the reason we need normalize, so normalize is uh, subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation. We didn't need that for a random forest, because for a random forest we're just uh, looking at less than or greater than through our binary splits. So all that matters is the order of things, how they're sorted, it doesn't matter whether they're super big or super small. But it definitely matters for neural nets, because we have these linear layers. So we don't want to have um, you know, things with kind of crazy distributions with some super big numbers and super small numbers, because it's not going to work. So it's always a good idea to normalize things in neural nets, and so we can do that in a tabular um, neural net by using the normalize uh, tabular proc. So we can do the same thing that we did before with creating our tabular pandas, tabular object for the neural net, and then we can create data loaders from that with a batch size. And this is a large batch size because tabular models don't generally require nearly as much GPU RAM as a, um, a convolutional neural net or something, or, a, or an RNN or something. Um, since it's a regression model, we're going to want R range. So let's find the minimum and maximum of our dependent variable. Okay, and we can now go ahead and create a tabular learner. So our tabular learn is going to take our data loaders, our way range, how many um, activations do you want in each of the linear layers, and so you can have as many linear layers as you like here. Yeah? Um, how many outputs are there? So this is a regression with a single output. And what loss function do you want? Uh, we can use LRFind, and then we can go ahead and use fit one cycle. There's no pre-trained model, obviously, because this is not something where people have got pre-trained models for, for uh, industrial equipment auctions, <laughs> so we just use fit one cycle, and train for a minute, and then we can check, and our RMSC is 0.226, which here was 0.230. So that's amazing, we actually have, you know, straight away a better result and the random forest. It's a little more fussy, it took so it takes a little bit longer, um, but as you can see, you know, for um, interesting data sets like this, um, we can get some great results with neural nets. So here's something else we could do though. The random forest and the neural net, they each have their own pros and cons. There's some things they're good at and there's some things they're less good at. Um, so maybe we can get the best of both worlds. 
And a really easy way to do that is to use Ensemble. So we've already seen that a random forest is a decision tree ensemble. So now we can put that into another ensemble. We could have an ensemble of the random forest and a neural net. There's lots of super fancy ways you can do that, but a really simple way is to take the average. So sum up the predictions from the two models, divide by two, and use that as a prediction. So that's our ensemble prediction, is just literally the average of the random forest prediction and the neural net prediction. And that gives us 0.223 versus 0.226. So uh, how good is that? Well, it's a little hard to say because unfortunately this uh, competition is old enough that we can't even submit to it and find out how we would have gone on Kaggle. Uh, so we don't really know. And so we're relying on our own validation set. Um, but it's quite a bit better than even the first place score on the test set. Um, so if the validation set is, you know, doing a good job, then this is a good sign that this is a really, really good model. Which wouldn't necessarily be that surprising um, because, you know, in the last few years, uh, I guess we've learned a lot about building these kinds of models, and uh, we're kind of taking advantage of a lot of the tricks um, that have that have appeared in recent years. And um, yeah, maybe this goes to show that. Well, I think it certainly goes to show that both random forests and neural nets have a lot to offer. And um, try both, and maybe even combine both. Um, We've talked about an approach to ensembling called bagging, which is where we train lots of models on different subsets of the data, take the average of them. Um, another approach to ensembling, um, particularly ensembling of trees, is called boosting. And boosting involves training a small model which underfits your data set. So maybe like just have a very small number of leaf nodes. And then you calculate the predictions using the small model. And then you subtract the predictions from the targets. So these are kind of like the errors of your small underfit model. And we call them residual. And then go back to step one. But now, instead of using the original targets, use the residuals. So train a small model which underfits your data set, attempting to predict the residuals. Then do that again. again. In, until you reach some stopping criterion, such as the maximum number of trees. Now, you, that will leave you with a bunch of models which you don't average, but which you sum, because each one is creating a model that's based on the residual of the previous one. So we've subtracted the predictions of each new tree from the residuals of the previous tree. So the residuals get smaller and smaller, and then to make predictions, we just have to do the opposite, which is to add them all together. So there's lots of variants of this. Um, um, but you'll see things like GBMs for gradient-boosted machines, or GPTTs for gradient-boosted decision trees. Um, and there's lots of uh, minor details around, you know, minor and significant details. But the basic idea is, is what I've shown. Two about. questions. All right, let's take the questions. So dropping features in a model is a way to reduce the complexity of the model and thus reduce overfitting. Is this better than adding some regularization like weight decay to tabular? Um, I didn't claim that we removed columns to avoid overfitting. We removed the columns to simplify are things to analyze and uh, it should also mean we don't need as many trees but there's no particular reason to believe that this will regularize and you know, the idea of regularization doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to random forests you can always add more trees is there a good heuristic for picking the number of linear layers in the tabular model not really. Well, if there is, I don't know what it is. Um, I guess two. 
through hidden layers works pretty well. Um, so you know what I showed. Those those the numbers I showed are pretty good for a, a large-ish model. Um, by default, it uses two hundred and one hundred. So maybe start with the default, and then go up to five hundred and two fifty. If that ends an improvement, then like just keep doubling them uh, until it stops improving or until you run out of memory or time. Main thing to note about um, boosted models is that there's nothing to stop us from overfitting. If you add more and more trees to a bagging model, sort of a random forest, it's going to get, uh, going to should generalize better and better because you're, each time you're using a new model which is based on a subset of the data. Um, but boosting, each model will fit the training set better and better, gradually overfit more and more. So Boosting methods do require generally more hyperparameter tuning and fiddling around with things. You know, you certainly have regularization. Boosting. They're pretty sensitive to their hyperparameters, which is why they're not normally my, my first go-to. Um, but uh, they, they often, they more often win Kaggle competition random forests do. Like they, they tend to be good at getting that last little bit of performance. So the last thing I'm going to mention is something super neat, which a lot of people don't seem to know exists. There's a shangs, it's super cool. Which is something from the um, entity embeddings paper, the table from it, where what they did was they um, built a neural network, they got the entity embeddings, EE, and then they tried a random forest using the entity embeddings as predictors rather than um, the approach I described with just the, the raw categorical variables. And the, um, the error for a random forest went from 0.16 to 0.11, a huge improvement. And a very simple method, KNN, went from 0.29 to 0.11. Basically all of the methods, when they used entity embeddings, Suddenly improved a lot. Um, the one thing you, you you should try if you have a look at the further research section of, after the questionnaire is it, it asks to try to, to do this. Actually take those entity embeddings that we trained in the neural net and use them in the random forest. And then maybe try ensembling again and see if you can beat the uh, 0.223 that we had. Because this is a really nice idea. It's like you get, you know, um, all the benefits of, of boosted decision trees, um, but all of the nice features of entity embeddings. Um, and so this is something that yeah, not enough people seem to be playing with for some reason. So overall, um, you know, random forests are nice and easy to train. They're, you know, they're very resilient. They don't require much pre-processing. They train quickly. They don't overfit. Um, you know, they can be a little less accurate. And um, they can be a bit slow at inference time, because for inference you have to go through every one of those trees. Having said that, a binary tree can be pretty heavily optimized. Um, so, um, you know, it is something you can basically create a totally compiled version of a tree. Uh, and they can certainly also be done entirely um, uh, in parallel. Um, so that's something to, to consider. Um, gradient boosting machines are also fast to train on the whole, um, but a little more fussy about hyperparameters. You have to be careful about overfitting, um, but a bit more accurate. Um, neural nets may be the fussiest to deal with. Um, they've kind of got the least um, rules of thumb around or tutorials around saying this is kind of how to do it. It's just a bit a bit newer, a little bit less well understood, um, but they can give better results in many situations than the other two approaches, or at least with an ensemble can improve the other two approaches. Um, so I would always start with a random forest um, and then see if you can beat it using these. So yeah, why don't you now see if you can find a Kaggle competition with tabular data, whether it's running now or it's a past one, and see if you can repeat this process for that and see if you can get in the top 
of the private leaderboard. That would be a really great uh, stretch goal at this point. Um, implement the decision tree algorithm yourself. I think that's an important one. We so really understand it. And then from there, create your own random forest from scratch. You might be surprised it's not that hard. Um, and then go and have a look at the tabular model source code. And at this point, this is pretty exciting. Um, you should find you pretty much know what all the lines do, with two exceptions. Um, and if you don't, you know, dig around and explore and experiment and see if you can figure it out. Uh, and with that, we are, um, I am very excited to say at a point where we've really dug all the way in to the end of these real, valuable, effective, fast AI applications, and we're understanding what's going on inside them. Uh, what should we expect for next week? So for next week, we will at NLP and Division. And we'll do the same kind of idea, is delve, delve deep to see what's going on. Thanks, everybody. See you next week.